This is 15 Minutes to Freedom. I'm your host, Ryan Nidell, and today's episode is Bye Bye Truck. So some of you may have known, if you've listened to the majority of my podcasts or any of them before, I used to run car dealerships. And it started out as a sales position, eventually worked into management and this, that, the other. So running car dealerships, probably a little bit of a misnomer. I was at my highest level general sales manager, but never was GM. But in that, I have this massive, massive affliction for cars. And not just any cars, nice cars. Like There's nothing wrong with a, a Honda Accord with leather and a sunroof and or even just a base Honda Accord. It's just not what gets my motor running. Like That does not get me excited. Nice cars get me excited. More specifically, fast, nice cars get me excited. That's just always been my thing. Even from a young child, like it was so interesting to people that I would leave a financial, uh, I say advisor position that's probably even higher than it was, working for Western Southern Financial doing life and health insurance sales to jump into the quote unquote illustrious industry of car sales. Really like a last, a last ditch effort to make money is what most people look at that as. Where for me, I'd wanted to sell cars for as long as I could remember because I loved everything about them. And so... I just got done working for a gentleman that was very affluent and he was, you know, had Corvettes and seven series BMWs and motorcycles, all this crazy stuff. And it it opened my eyes up to there's this whole other echelon of the way that the automotive world works. You know, I came from a middle class family, maybe upper middle class. You know, it was a big deal when we leased a new car every three years and certainly none of them had leather. And I don't remember any of them having a sunroof. It was just nice to have a new car. And so I'm around all these new cars and I remember, you know, driving a Gosh, at that point, maybe a 2000 Corvette was the first stick shift car I, I drove and learned how to drive. And it was just incredible. Like, such such power, such then trust from the guy I was working for to allow me to drive this car. And I treated it like my own. I mean, rode it hard, but babied it. And that was my first real feel for what I would call a fast car. And so these cars, that love for fast cars just transitioned right into a career. And the career I did well at, you know, definitely still have that thing inside of me. Us, us quote unquote car guys say that once it's in you, it never leaves. Like you either love the industry and you want to stay in it forever or you get out and you hate it. Well, I got out not because I hate it. I was just burned out on the hours. You know, it wasn't for me. I, I found out eventually, you know, I was making, gosh, at that point, 140, 160 grand a year. I was working two full-time jobs. So it was at least 80 hours a week minimum. So I'm not really making that much money. I'm just working two full-time jobs, making eighty thousand dollars a year, which again is still good money. Like I'm not bashing that level of income, just to put you know a perspective on where my mind was at at that time. So as I progressed and got into the digital marketing world and web hosting and affiliate marketing, all the stuff that goes on in that that realm, I started to become a little bit more well off. And I can remember as a as a sales consultant, affiliate manager, we called it back then, my first big commission check, the, the day. Yeah, it was 60 days into working for the new company, get that first big commission check, and I had more money in that commission check for one month than I'd made my entire first year in the car business. You know, I made about 42 grand the first year in the car business, and I made more than that in a month. And I'm, I'm pinching myself, like, this can't be real. This isn't real life. This isn't how the world's supposed to work. Like, I'm at that point, I'm, I'm telling myself this bullshit story that I'm nobody special. Like, why should I have this amount of money, and what can I do with it? So as a 27-year-old man at that point, might even been 26, the first damn thing I want to do is go buy a car, like immediately. So I run out to a dealership that was a local dealership to Akron and bought myself a used full-size Range Rover. Now, when I took the job with the hosting company, I got out of the car business and found it to be pertinent that I would buy a Cadillac Escalade. Obviously not fast, big, nice, luxurious. What I didn't take into consideration was I was driving from Columbus to Akron every day, round trip. So this beautiful Escalade that I thought I had to have that I paid probably way too much money for, I bought it used. I was getting like 12 or 13 miles to the gallon on the highway. So it was a very short period of time before that was just not the right car for me. So I traded that in and, and bought a used Lexus, GS350, 300. I don't know what it was, it doesn't matter. But get this first check, and I'm like, man, I gotta have a Range Rover. I've always wanted a Range Rover. So I find this Range Rover, it's a $20,000 used Range Rover. I was so proud I could walk in and just hand him a check for it. You know, no car payments, finally. And I'm excited, and it's fantastic. And I keep that car for quite some time. And eventually, you know, life keeps progressing. And I end up at some point with a new, well, not, I don't even have to say at some point. Loving cars, I was switching out of cars every four to six months. I'm switching out of cars every four to six months because I still have access to, you know, the dealer's license and the auction prices. So I'm paying essentially wholesale for cars, just losing tax and title plus the depreciation of miles. But it's costing me a couple thousand bucks every six months to drive and flip out of a car. Never really felt bad to me. So at some point I get rid of the Range Rover, 
get rid of you know the, the Lexus, and I'm, I'm in a, a newer body style 7 Series, a 740i, short wheelbase. Makeup a year, doesn't matter, I'll say 2010. And again, I'm still living in Columbus, but working out of Akron and driving back and forth just about every day. So I'm driving back and forth every day. I realize that my car needs service. Check engine lights on or service do with lights on. So I drive into the local dealership in, in Akron, local BMW dealership. And then no big deal, pull in. It's raining outside. It's pouring down rain. Like, hey, I need to get a service done. They're not busy. They, they squeeze me and I'm walking around the showroom floor. As I'm walking around, I see this gorgeous black M5 with red leather interior. Black floor mats, black dashboard, just red seats. And I see it, it's written on the windshield and come from the car world. I know this is a leftover car. This is a 2013 or 2014 model. You're going into the year 2014. So it's a year old, essentially, and it hasn't been driven. So uh, one of the managers comes up and said, oh, you look great in that car. So, well, of, of course, anybody would look great in this car. I mean, this is a world-class automobile. But I don't think I can afford it. Because sticker price in the car at that point, I think it's 119 grand or so. It had every option possible. I saw there's a bunch of money cash back, and we'll, get, we'll sell it to you for 100 grand. And I laughed because my highest car note at that point in my life was like $35,000. I just, number one, didn't ever have the affluence to back up that level of purchase. And number two, started buying cars in cash. So I'm laughing. I said, look, I'll make you a deal. If you get me approved on the car, I'll buy it. I won't even drive it right now. I think there's literally zero chance in the world I'm going to get approved for this car. And I, I had that same feeling back when I bought my first car out of college, which was just a Pontiac Grand Prix. It was the same nervous tension at that point when I was making 35 or 40 grand a year. And I'm sitting across from a finance manager, like praying fingers crossed under the desk, please get me approved because I want the car. I just wanted it. And so the BMW, the guy comes out, the finance manager says, well, congratulations, you got yourself a new M5. And I laugh. Like, I think he's completely fucking with me. There's no way this guy's telling me the truth. But he is. And there's 0.9% financing for 72 months. So it's going to sound a little crazy. I know this. But I end up leaving the dealership in a new M5 on a rainy day, on a late on a Friday, with an $1,150 car payment. Now, keep in mind, I'm making what I think is good income at that point. Not, not the level that I had just previously described to you, but a good amount of money. More than a quarter million dollars a year was coming into my bank account every, you know, across the course of a year. So pretty low debt structure, have this car. I love cars. So I'm able to justify away like I got to have this car. It makes sense to me. I didn't need this car at all. I'm driving this M5 and I love the M5. And then eventually step away from the hosting company. Like we're the, the original founding partners and I don't necessarily eye to eye with where the company's going. Admittedly, I might not be qualified to run the company. So take a step back and end up not having to travel back and forth from Akron so much. Kind of almost migrate back into a sales role. And that worked out well. I'm not putting miles on the M5. Loving being around Columbus more. Have this incredible car. That I just love everything about it. Well, time progresses, and my income is not staying at the level that it previously was. Times aren't as easy. So I'm like, shit, what am I going to do? Because a $1,150 a month car payment is a significant car payment. Well, what happens is I, there's an, it's right when the new Corvette body style is coming out. So I'm like, i got to get the new Corvette then. At least I can save money because the new Corvette's a $55,000 car. So I traded my M5 on a new Corvette. My payment goes from 1100 bucks a month down to $550. i am like, ooh, I can breathe. Now, now there's another 600 bucks a month that's disposable income for me. I drive the Corvette for a while, and th then I start dating Lindsay. Well, Lindsay, as, as you know, I have a beautiful what we call bonus daughter in Gianna. And Gianna and Lindsay don't fit all that well in a Corvette at the same time. You know, I've, I was previously dating a woman that had kids, but she had a four-door car, and Admittedly, now that I can just be honest with it, I probably didn't even care. Like the woman I was dating before, Lindsay, just it, it didn't matter. I convinced myself that relationship mattered more than it did. But it was a story I told myself. So I go with Lindsay, and I'm like, I got to get another car. Well, of course, I have the option to buy a, what I'll call a nice regular car. We'll go back to a Honda Accord. Or why not go ahead and get a Porsche Panamera Turbo? I mean, I've never owned one before. I've owned it feels like everything else under the sun at this point. So I find a dealership out of Cleveland and buy myself a new Porsche Panamera Turbo, meet them halfway, trade in my Corvette, and my payment goes from 500 or 550 a month back up to about 1000 a month, maybe 900 doesn't matter what the number was. I'm driving this Porsche Panamera Turbo, and I think I'm king shit, because as far as the world knows, I'm on top of it all. I've got a house. I think at that point I have a Range Rover Sport Supercharged 2 in the garage, a couple motorcycles, a couple rental properties. As far as the outside world knows, I'm king shit. Inside, I'm crumbling as a man. My incomes went from, you know, at, at its highest point, six or $70,000 a month, down to a point that I haven't made a dollar in probably six or eight months. 
which wouldn't be a big deal if I was financially intelligent enough to sit down and save some of the money I was making during those high income times. But I wasn't. I was taking trips and buying people stuff I didn't need to and jewelry and all types of stuff. And so I don't have any money left. I've just started dating Lindsay. And like one of our first dates we went on, I bought us pretty much front row tickets to a Beyonce and Jay-Z concert in Cincinnati. And I was so self-assured that I, I bought the tickets. The, the concert wasn't until June or July. And I bought the tickets in May and was like pounding my chest. And so I'm setting this whole framework up, like start dating this girl and get rid of a two-door car and buy a nice four-door car and get us these expensive tickets. And inside I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for any of this shit. So things keep progressing. And Lindsay and I keep getting closer and closer. And my income is not coming like I thought it would. The new businesses that I've started up are costing me money, not making me money on a consistent basis. And so the day comes towards the end of the end of the summer. First snowfall hasn't hit yet. Then I'm driving home and I've told everybody the story that I got rid of the Panamera because it wasn't comfortable because the seats were, were hard. And of course they were, the seats were hard. I mean, it's a sports oriented car. The real reason I got rid of it is because I couldn't afford it anymore. You know, the, the $900,000 payment that I justified that made sense. I'm freaking out every month and I'm consistently at least five days late making the payment because I can't get my schedule around the right way when it comes to bills. I just can't. There's no money coming in. I'm juggling. I've stopped paying the rent or I've stopped paying the, the mortgage on one of my rental properties. So I'm using the rental income from that to pay for the car payment. And there's this weird overlapping cycle where admittedly I'm being a piece of shit. I'm just lying to people, but we've covered that in other episodes. So I pass a, a dealership on my way home and I see a new Ford F-250 black platinum pickup truck. Parked right on the right on the point we would call it in the, in the car world, right by the road. Whip this black on black Panamera turbo in, go inside and said, I want that truck. I want you to take the Panamera, and I want that truck. And these people are looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm trading in a hundred and sixty thousand dollar new Panamera for a sixty thousand dollar pickup truck. Nothing about me says pickup truck. I don't plow snow, I don't trailer things, I don't live on a farm. I just always wanted a diesel pickup truck. Now the funny part is behind the scenes. I was struggling to get approved for the pickup truck. Like I've always had a 740, 760 credit score, always paid everybody back on time until this business that I'm working on isn't working and I'm out of capital, I'm out of cash. And so here I sit going from 0.9% financing on the, on the original M5 to now I'm, I'm lucky to get approved. And I think I'm paying 10 or 12% interest. Okay, well, nobody knows that other than me. And my payment's still 800 bucks a month. So I justify that I'm saving 300 bucks a month or 200 bucks a month over the Panamera Turbo. And I leave in this pickup truck and come home and, you know, Lindsay loves a pickup truck, but at this point I'm still being a little bit of a, a lot of a piece of shit. And I'm still somewhat spending time with another woman that hates the pickup truck. I'm like, man, there's just a polar opposite. Like this makes sense. I'm not supposed to be with the woman on the left. I'm supposed to be with Lindsay as I obviously am. This is taking me back four years now. And so as I'm sitting here in this pickup truck and I'm driving around and I eventually jump into suit sales, you know, I was a salesperson for a local suit company. And in this local suit company, I was on the road all the time. And so I ended up buying a car, cash, like a $5,000 car, to just run miles up on. It was an old Audi A8. Probably a like, late, late 90s, early 2000s. Bought it with 150,000 miles on it. Just something that could get me around that was comfortable enough for my body size. But I saw the pickup truck. At this point, my ball of yarn starting to unravel. Lindsay and I live together now. I've, I've completely, I'm not around the, the ex-girlfriend at all anymore. Nowhere even close. And... I'm sharing all these things with Lindsay now, like, look, I'm basically broke. Like, I don't have the money you thought I had. Moreover, I'm, my house is about to get repossessed because um, I haven't made the payment. I've been living off that to pay my car payment and keeping this facade up like I'm, I'm not the person you think I am. And I don't know why, but she decides to stay with me. Like, she doesn't leave me over this. And moreover, does she not only not leave me, she, in that short period of time, helps me catch up the mortgage payments on the property so I can sell off the rental property. Well, we ended up getting all our cash back and made a little bit of money because I'd had this property for seven or eight years, maybe even longer. But without her, I would have been completely screwed in that situation. So we, I'm selling suits and I'm, I can sell water to a whale if I had to. I'm a, I'm a sales guy by nature. So I'm doing well in the suit world. I'm driving this old Audi around and I still have the pickup truck and we're still making the payment on it, but I'm making just enough every month to pay the payment. I've got a couple thousand bucks in savings now, you know, let's say five or 6,000 bucks. And I'm a month behind on my pickup truck payment. And it's spring, and I'm downtown in, in the pickup truck and park it at the, the, the storefront that I was working at. And I get a phone call of somebody that's been trying to, quote-unquote, set up an appointment with me to, 
take you know to to come look at suits. And so when I get in, he sets the appointment and, and the whole thing. Well, long story short, it wasn't actually somebody that wanted suits. It was the repo company coming to hook up my F-250 diesel pickup truck. Because I wasn't really one month behind. I ended up being two months behind. And they'd reach out to me. They gave me plenty of opportunities. It wasn't a thing of where, you know, they were quietly behind the scenes. I mean, they were calling me consistently looking for payment. And I didn't know what the fuck to do. You know, I'm two months behind. And I probably needed three full months. So that's 2500 bucks or so with whatever fees, or maybe it was, you know, give or take, 22, 23, 24, doesn't matter. It was thousands of dollars. And I remember having a little bit more than that to my name in my bank account. And so I'm there, the guy, you know, the tow truck driver's outside, and he's, he's hooking up this brand new platinum F-250 diesel pickup truck on his crane. And it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon in downtown Columbus on a sunny spring day, and everybody around knows what's going on. And I'm sitting there a little mortified. Like, what do I do? And so get my belongings out of the truck, the majority of them. And I let them take the truck. And I call Lindsay and say, hey, sweetheart, like, this is what's happened. Here's where we're at. You know, I have the other car to drive. She's like, well, let's let's talk to him and let's, let's see if we can get the truck back. All right. So, you know, wait and go through Ford's process. And they want to charge me, I think it was $8,900 in fees and penalties and uh, all this stuff. They wanted multiple payments up front and all these things. And... I didn't have the cash. You know, here I am, if I look back, just in a two-year time period, I was a guy making somewhere between three fifty and five hundred grand a year, living at that point high off the hog, splurging on everything, multiple cars, multiple women, multiple motorcycles, multiple everything, to literally the lowest point in my life where I'm driving an old Audi A8 and my pickup truck's just been repossessed. And I tell all these people in my life at that point, and many of you listen to this podcast, I was I told everybody that we sold the pickup truck, that we sold it, and that I chose to drive the Audi because it set the right precedence to the people that I was meeting for suits, because no one would want to buy suits for me if I looked like I was doing better than them. All that was bullshit. The truth of the matter is, I wasn't financially sound enough to really afford the pickup truck when I first got it. And had I not been friends with the guys at the car dealership, I probably couldn't have pulled it off. That I was, eight months earlier, already on the verge of plummeting into bankruptcy. If it wasn't for Lindsay, I would have been there. And so we sit and Lindsay and I are talking and I have this truck and I've got a little bit of money in cash. I'm like, I think I'm just going to have to let the truck go back. And I do. I let the truck get repossessed. And subsequently thereafter, of course, my credit shot and all the things that go into that. And I've also defaulted on an American Express card and something else at that point. I'd have to go look. But Two or three things I just don't have the money for because I've been living so inappropriately with everything in my life. Because I'm convinced this never-ending well of money is always going to be there. Because it it came out of nowhere. The abundance that I was able to create almost overnight in this hosting company just felt like it was a never-ending pool of cash. But it did end. And when it ended, I was too fucking prideful to stop and say, look, I have to change what I'm doing. Like, I have to alter my spending habits. I have to be honest with myself and the people around me. I was living this facade. I was living this bullshit fucking lie for years. Like, embarrassed, not comfortable in my own skin to look at my friends at that point, who, if I look back, are all mooching off me in some capacity. You know, me buying dinners or me paying for trips or whatever it was at that point. I was too insecure to sit down and say, look, I just can't do this anymore. I can't afford to live this lifestyle. And so my truck's gone. And I'm embarrassed. And I tell all these people these bullshit stories, literally up until right now. There's probably 10 people on the planet, maybe 15, 20. The number doesn't matter, but there's a certain number of people on the planet that know the real story. Well, now you guys know the real story. I was fucking broke. Broke as can be. No money. Truck repossessed. The last prideful possession that I had, based off the way I used to live my life, was now gone. And it's taken me all the way, it's taken me another two and a half, three years to get to the point of being comfortable owning this position. Because there's, there's such peace and, and tranquility in owning the fact that I fucked up. And I fucked up bad. I lied. I cheated. I didn't pay bills. I did a bunch of shit that any person with a good moral compass would not do. And all was based off insecurity. It was all avoidable. It's nobody else's fault. I'm only responsible for, I'm responsible for not only the good stuff in my life, but also all the bad. You can't have one without the other. You can't appreciate the light in the situation unless you know the dark. And I know the dark. I know having to call my now fiance, soon to be wife, 
and say my truck just got repossessed and having people look at me in downtown Columbus as I've, you know, people know me in the city not all that well, but know me enough. And they're like pointing and almost laughing. At least that's how it feels to me. And I'm so fucking embarrassed. But for what? Like they didn't live in my shoes. They don't know what I've been through. They don't know the good and the bad. So how many places in your life, if you're honest with yourself, are you just fucking lying? Lying to yourself. Lying to your friends, lying to your family. Like, where are you telling bullshit stories at? Because you're afraid of what someone's going to think about you. So I can tell you, at this point in life, if you don't like me because I got my truck repossessed two and a half years ago, I don't need you in my life. There's a valuable lesson here for me. So where in your life, let's say, let's look at your, your body, that you're insecure about some part of your body and you're ashamed to show your significant other. You're dating somebody you don't want to show them because you're afraid of their judgment. Fuck them. If they don't love you for your stretch marks or your messed up teeth or your funny accent, you don't need them in your life. What about in your business? You know, where are you telling people you're doing better than you actually are? Because we all think as men, and I can only speak to the men, that the amount of money that you make in business ends up being some ultimate dick measuring contest that nobody fucking cares about. People care how you make them feel. They don't care about how much fucking money you make. You know, where is it across your relationship that you're lying to people that you're being a good person? Are you always telling the truth to your partner? Are you flirting with people when you get away from the person you're supposed to be with? All these little lies stack up and they're all instantly changeable. Like it's all a fucking decision you're making on a day over day basis to tell the truth and do the right thing. And trust me from where I come from, it wasn't easy. It's not always easy, but the truth is so much more powerful than a lie. So guys, if you keep telling the truth enough day over day, week over week, I guarantee you it's going to help you get one step closer to your goal. And in that taking one step forward every day, ultimately equates to you getting shit done. Hey guys, Ryan here. Thanks for joining me today. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please head over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume audio and subscribe to 15 Minutes to Freedom. If this brought you value, please do me a favor and drop me a five-star rating. Then share this podcast with someone who needs to hear it. For additional content, head over to ryannidell.com. That's R-Y-A-N-N-I-D-D-E-L.com.